How does a lawnmower slice through the toughest grass without stalling? What keeps a mechanical watch ticking without a battery? And how do you design a pinball machine that keeps players on their toes? To answer these mysteries, we dive deep inside these and other extraordinary machines to reveal the secrets of how things work. The lawnmower. How does this backyard workhorse cut through the thickest grass on all terrains without jamming? More than 350 components work together. An engine pumps as fast as a car. To spin a blade over 50 times a second. The blade's twisted ends act like helicopter propellers, creating air currents that suck the grass up and into a container at the back. The breakneck speed of the blade whips a belt around the machine at the speed of a chainsaw, powering the wheels, making this 45-kilogram machine effortless to maneuver. It can manicure a lawn in minutes. The key to the mower's muscle is the design of its engine. It must be powerful enough to swirl the cutting blade round into a frenzy without cracking under the strain. Workers at one of America's largest die-casting factories use a special technique to cast the engine out of lightweight aluminium. The aluminum, whenever we pour it in a die, it's 1,200 degrees. Larry is in charge of this high-temperature production line. He must control the temperature of the molten aluminium precisely. If it's too hot, Tiny air bubbles can form in the metal and weaken the engine. We have water going through the die to keep them cool. Sometimes we could have the water too cold, running too much. We can cut it back and warm the parts up. The die stays closed for roughly 13 seconds, long enough to solidify the aluminum. So when the robot takes it out, it's roughly anywhere from 4 to 600 degrees. Air holes invisible to the naked eye could cause the engine to fail, so workers leave nothing to chance. We're looking for various things, cracks, air holes. Brenda checks every engine part is faultless. She uses this X-ray machine to see right through to their inner core. As you can see here, there's little white spots showing that this part does have air holes. It could cause a leaky cylinder. I will take it back to the technician, and then I will discard this part. These precision cast, super strong engines pack a serious punch. The engine turns the blade 50 times a second to pulverize the grass. If it slows down, the grass won't cut cleanly and the mower will clog up. So there's a hidden mechanism to keep the blade spinning at exactly the right speed. It's called the governor, and it's the lawnmower's cruise control. It uses flyweights to detect the speed of the blade. If the crankshaft slows down, the flyweights decelerate, fall inwards, and trigger a lever to open the throttle and pump in more fuel. This boosts the engine's power and spins the blade back up to the perfect cutting speed of 3,000 RPM.
A lawnmower's blades don't just cut the grass. They also lift it up and blow it out into a container at the back. Workers give blades a unique shape, the secret to this lift and blow. Each of the features that you see on this blade causes the grass to perform differently once it's cut. Chief metal wrangler Monty sculpts every blade. The purpose of the blade itself and each of the features is to lift the grass once it's been cut. 200 tons of pressure, the weight of a passenger plane, sculpts special twists at each end. These contours not only raise the grass up, they also position it right in the path of these razor-sharp blades. Once it's lifted, it's suspended underneath the deck of the mower. While it's suspended, the feature of the blade itself cuts it that much more. It actually cuts the grass multiple times. But the blade's clever shape is under constant threat. If it hits a stone or rock hidden in the grass, it could shatter at over 300 kilometers per hour. So workers use heat to harden the blades. the blade isn't heat treated properly, those violent impacts could cause the blade to come apart. Jeff's mission is to make these blades almost indestructible. This is a very unique heat treat process in that it hardens the blade in a very, very special way. He heats the blades to over 800 degrees, as hot as lava and then cools them rapidly. We're cooling the blade very quickly, and that's where the hardening process takes place. Steel starts out in one crystalline structure, so the atoms are all arranged in a certain way. To get it hard, we then arrange those atoms in a different crystalline shape, and that's what's going on in heat treat. This blade is four times the strength after it comes out of the hardening operation. Now, if the blade hits a rock at over 300 kilometers per hour, it can carry on cutting with hardly a scratch. With so much metal crammed under its skin, you'd expect this machine to feel heavy. So how do mowers make pushing uphill easy? The secret is self-powered wheels. One engine drives both the blade and the wheels. As the blade spins at 3,000 times a minute, a belt carries this breakneck speed to the gearbox, which steps down the speed seven times. A cable connected to a lever on the handlebar allows the driver to fine tune the speed by adjusting the belt's tension. These innovations make sure this four-wheel drive always moves at the optimum pace. With so much power, mowers could cause serious harm if debris flies out and hits the driver. To stop these high-speed projectiles, the mower body must be solid. Workers on this line shape 2,000 mower bodies a day. Lawn mowers are very high impact machines. You want to have this very few welds, if any, to eliminate any of the, the actual debris coming from holes on the top side of the deck. Mike mans the machine that makes lawn mower bodies almost indestructible. This is one of the largest presses on the market. This thing forms this part from a blank sheet of steel. It wouldn't know the difference of a hand or a part. The press bends each steel sheet under 540 tons of pressure. That's enough to crush a man in seconds. These machines operate with two palm buttons. The palm buttons keep all of our operators out of the press.
the press forms a rock-solid, extra-durable casing. Every year, millions of mowers like this help people around the world manicure immaculate lawns without breaking a sweat. They're expertly crafted, heavy-duty machines that deserve serious respect. the pinball machine. It dominated arcades in the 70s, but today's versions use hidden digital technology to give gamers the ultimate thrill. More than 3,000 rapid-firing components work in unison. Half a kilometer of wiring connects them all beneath the playfield. A power spring launches the 80-gram steel pinball into play. 14 kickers with lightning reactions fire in a split second. Hidden below lurks a box of tricks to shake the entire machine. And a high-speed computer keeps track of the score, blaring it out so players can keep their eyes on the ball. How do you build a machine like this that can keep players guessing? Today's pinball machines use a mix of traditional and digital technology to keep players on their toes. The secret to the ultimate game lies in the way the workers put the machine's components together. This 3,700 square meter factory in New Jersey is just one of two pinball makers in the US. Ken wires up the pinball's digital mechanics. What we tried to do was take the old school pinball and intertwine it with new technology. The LED lighting, we introduced the 27-inch monitor into the game also. We're trying to connect with the video game era. Ken builds special targets into the playfield that respond in unpredictable ways to really test players' reflexes. This game has a lot of rules and different layers. So the first time you hit these targets, it'll do one thing. The second time you hit these targets, it'll do something else. Connecting the pinball's 3,000 parts together is no simple task. Roughly 22 and a half hours per play field. And that's from the time it gets pulled out of the cabinet and inspected until the time it's going into a cabinet. What makes each pinball game unique is a secret mechanism that catapults the balls across the play field. It's a miniature magnetic marvel known as the solenoid coil reflex. Faster than the blink of an eye, a contact switch detects the impact of a pinball and triggers the coil to create a magnetic field. The field is so strong that it pulls a magnetic plunger inside and kicks a rubber slingshot out within 10 milliseconds. 14 of these lightning-fast magnets bounce the ball around at up to five meters per second to keep even the quickest players on their toes. To take on such a physical game, it's vital that players can respond to every tiny movement of the ball. Their secret weapon? Flippers. The flippers are the feel of the game. That's what draws people in. Larry creates these intricate mechanisms. People love pinball machines because they, they can feel the ball moving, they can feel the flippers flipping. It's not something you're sitting on your couch watching on a TV screen that's not real. Uh, pinball machines are real. The retro feel of the flippers is so important that Larry builds them using parts developed by pinball pioneers. The solenoids that you find in your grandfather's pinball machine are still in our machine. So you still have the feel of old retro with new. 
But rapid-fire flippers and catapults are not enough for today's players. To add extra buzz, parts of the game trigger the whole table to vibrate. Right under the playfield hides a fist-sized gadget that uses a trick borrowed from vibrating mobile phones. An electric motor spins two 130-gram off-center weights at up to 3,000 times a minute. It shakes the entire machine like an earthquake. Its fun and interactive design made pinball an arcade classic. Thanks to a clever mix of traditional parts and digital technology, it still pulls in the crowds today. <laughs> it's the tough, clever miniature machine that keeps your bike, gates and garage secure. The padlock. What makes this seemingly simple device almost impossible for thieves to break? 41 parts work together, sealed inside two kilos of hardened, solid steel. To outsmart thieves, two precision cast ball bearings lock the padlock shackle in place. They make it impossible to move the shackle from the outside. 18 tiny, super strong pins and springs hold the lock shut. Shards of steel form an internal drill-proof armor. A storm-proof coat completes the resistance of this merciless machine. The secret to the padlock's resilience lies in the way workers create its tough outer casing. This is a 2.6 kilogram block of steel. It's going to be the strongest lock in the world. At one of the oldest lock factories in England, Terry mans the machine that hollows out the lock bodies. He precision cuts cavities inside each steel block. This is where the lock's components will sit. It's important all the holes are a nice tight fit, so when all the components go in together, it makes it more difficult when they try and break into the lock because everything's so tight, you just can't get it out. Terry must drill each hole to within 0.2 millimeters. If he makes them too large, thieves can move the parts around inside and break them. That's now ready for machining. Off it goes. We drill holes in the top to put the shackle in. Then there's holes in the side. There's a little hole in the bottom. Terry measures each hole to make sure it's exactly the right size. There you go. The shackle, it's a nice tight fit, as you can see. So that basically is ready for the next operation. The padlock secure casing helps keep thieves out. It protects an intricate lock mechanism that only opens with the right key. This is how it works. Six unique pins are used to check the shape of the key. They are made from ultra-strong nickel-coated brass and positioned to stop a cylinder from rotating. If the key's nooks line up exactly with the pins, they allow the cylinder to turn with the key. Using different pin heights, this padlock can be crafted for over a quarter of a million unique key shapes. 
Workers must install each bespoke lock mechanism inside the casing by hand. They top each lock off with a shackle made from hardened boron steel. It's four times stronger than regular steel. What makes the lock so strong is that you've got a 16 mil boron shackle. It's locked in with 12 mil hardened steel balls. Jim tests one in every 250 padlocks to destruction. I'm going to set this up in the tensile test machine. We use it to pull locks to see how strong they are. It goes up to 20 tons. This padlock must withstand 10 tons of force to pass quality control. And we're going to try and pull it. Hopefully, it will go way beyond 10 tons. You've got to protect in case anything comes flying out. Right. I've got tension now. Tension at two tons now. Each ton is equivalent to the weight of one car. So it's up to six tons. It's up to eight. It's come past 10. 12, on to 14 tons. I expect it to go somewhere around 16 or above. That's 17 now. Gonna break any second. Whoa! It takes the weight of a passenger bus to snap the shackle on this lock. So that's 17.4 tons. Very good. Precision drilled, hand built, and packed with thief busting parts, the padlock is a surprisingly intricate machine. The mechanical wristwatch. It keeps our lives running on schedule. So how does such a tiny machine keep perfect time no matter what we put it through? Beneath a transparent sapphire face, over 100 precision components make this machine tick. A paper-thin spring is the powerhouse. 12 wheels, a laser cut with accuracy thinner than a human hair. 25 shining jewels keep the wheels turning smoothly for over 100 years. And at the heart of the machine, the escapement keeps a precise rhythm, a design so effective it survived unchanged for centuries. Today's wristwatches run without an electric battery and don't need winding. So where does the power come from to keep them ticking all day long? Watchmakers at one of England's most innovative watch factories craft every one by hand. Powering a watch without an electric battery is a huge engineering challenge. The secret lies in an intricately wound spring, a mechanical battery. OK, so this is the main spring, which is the component that provides the power to the watch. Uh, it needs to be wound up. Rob has trained for six years to become a watchmaker. His challenge? Coil a 60 centimeter long strip of hardened steel over 20 times around this winder to form the spring. So the main spring, so you can see that incredibly long, something that's going to fit inside a, a case about 42 millimeters wide. There's so much tension in the spring. If you slip, then it can explode. Rob needs nerves of steel to squeeze the spring into the barrel that holds it in place. One slip, and it could blow up in his face. I saw a barrel explode in uh, one of my tutor's faces. 
still had visions of uh, a jagged cut that he had all the way up his eye. If the spring unwinds before he can secure it inside the barrel, it's game over. Okay, so that's the barrel totally assembled. So that is effectively your mechanical battery. There's enough energy stored in this wound spring to power a watch for 50 hours. This is how the spring slowly releases it to trigger one mechanical tick every second. In the nervous system of the watch, energy released from the spring powers a precision balanced wheel, which swings like the pendulum of a grandfather clock to set the ticking speed. Each rock of the pendulum unlatches one tooth of the escapement wheel, which ticks eight times every second, over 10 billion ticks in its lifetime. This intricate mechanism has kept people running on time for 500 years. A knock or impact could misalign the delicate components inside the watch. So it needs a tough casing to hold each part precisely in place. I've made the fast cars, now I'm making something that I can wear. Former Formula One engineer Pete designs watch bodies. Each cavity inside the body must be accurate to one-tenth the width of a human hair so the minute components fit snug. The tolerance have to be so small to make sure the parts connect when they're working, so it has to run nice and freely. At the heights of all the gears, the tolerances and the diameters, so everything just fits nicely. He programs this machine to sculpt the case from a solid bar of steel. If he makes the slightest error, the parts won't fit together inside the finished watch. If the tolerances are incorrect here, then everything else is going to be incorrect. This computer-controlled drill allows Pete to shave off microscopic metal slices. Looks good. Just need to measure it. Yes, that's with intolerance. And that's the case completed. Very good. Our busy lives make it easy to forget to wind up a watch's spring at the end of the day. So some modern watches have a secret. They can wind themselves. The key is human movement. A rotor shaped like a steering wheel swings with each motion of the wrist, cranking up the spring. The winding ratchets pivot on glinting rubies that hold a pool of oil smaller than a pinprick. Harder than steel, 25 of these jewels cut friction to keep the wheels turning smoothly for a lifetime. But positioning the microscopic jewels inside the watch is no simple task. Rob's number one enemy is dust. If just one speck falls into the watch, it can jam. We all wear finger cuts, which are attractive. Little hats for our fingers. We also wear these anti-static coats, not just for fashion. We have to take as many precautions as we can. The jewels must be precision placed. Their smooth, hard surfaces act as buffers to stop the metal components scraping together. A misplaced jewel could cause the gears to grind to a halt. We need to get it perfect. 
they do have a tendency of running away from you. These jewels, if you treat them right, shouldn't ever disintegrate. With 104 parts fully assembled, Rob checks that this watch will work whatever the wearer is doing. For that, he uses a chronoscope. This machine tests the watch in five different positions. We test it as if it were being read this way, as if it were upside down, by your side, out in front of you, or if you're scratching your head. We need to be sure that it will function optimally in all those positions to compensate for a range of different lifestyles. This one in particular is, is great. It's Everything about it is, is well within tolerance and exactly as we aim for, so happy days. Almost a billion mechanical watches sell around the world every year. They're a triumph of micro-engineering that will last for generations, leaving their digital cousins in the dust.